Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States. As we're looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we go to a planet of 9 billion people by 2050, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people and at the same time to allow them to have an increased standard of living and not just exist on planet Earth? And we have someone that's actually uh, looking into this, not just looking into it, but actually doing something about it. This is uh, Ron Ben Zev. He is the president and CEO of World Housing Solution. He's coming in by Skype and sitting right beside me is our special guest. Welcome back. Thank you. This is Joel Coulter, president of Mobile Sciences Consortium, and he's been with us a number of times before. Thank Always you, good to have you, Joel. And Ron, I believe you're here by Skype. Yes, I am. Hey. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, welcome, welcome, and uh, we're certainly glad to have you. Tell us a little bit about the mission and vision of your organization, and then we'll get into what it is that you're actually doing to help people really all over the globe. Uh, so, so we're on the Housing Solution was born to solve at, at first the uh, the plight of refugees. Uh, it turns out that every year, year after year, over the globe. Millions and millions of people are being displaced every year by man-made natural disasters. As people may know, recently we were hit by people right here in Florida, just hours from up. And uh, the devil absolutely unbelievable. And that's why we were we started off in a way that creates a simple, quick, some comfortable and safe a shelter for, for people all over the world. Yeah, looking at it, uh, you have a real emphasis as far as the green space is concerned to uh, make this housing very energy efficient, uh, remove uh, high levels of greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from these structures, also to make it very quiet and uh, easy to build. Why do you really have this emphasis on green structures? It, it's part of it. It's embedded in our DNA. Ultimately, we have a finite number of resources throughout the world. This is, planet, you know, there talks about planet A, there is no planet B, at least not in our lifetime. So how do we maintain the resources available to us today? And also, for the generations that have children uh, will have the ability to downrange and say it's about us, about them and their children, and their, you know, so how do we preserve and create a structure that is comfortable, even in ambient temperatures. Just using passive in and of itself is a whole structure to be. Those two are uh, the structures I would in route, you know, if they're lucky. And our ability to build a reasonable call structure that I have a high level of insulation with provide a comfortable environment for the people to live in. But so if you just write down the angel, if the, the Contrary to the environment, also implement the AC, for example, or, or other things. The amount of air conditioning you would need or heat to make our structures comfortable to live in is dramatically reduced compared to traditional structures. What that means is that the ripple effect is that that point in time, then the uh, the local environment, the local government um, municipality does not have to invest as much or create a big uh, of an of a um, electoral providing uh, entity, and so thereby the grid is reduced. They want to twin this solar power. That's where really the true benefit starts to really come in. And now you have a comfortable, quick to assemble, lightweight, but yet high wind resistant capability that houses people and will provide schools or provides you know community housing. Well, I think that's uh, really important. Exactly what you're saying, Joel. I think you have the next yeah, question. So Go ahead. Well, Ron, does having such an emphasis on a green structure have real value to the U.S. military or to consumers besides helping to reduce the greenhouse grass impacts on Earth? 
Yeah, we uh, actually just lost our Skype, Joel. So let's go ahead and we'll look at this. Uh, one of the things about having this highly insulated type of structure is that it reduces uh, not only the cost as far as right. the, the uh, energy that's going to be used, but also, too, if you're going to use solar, you're going to use wind or whatever, you want to have something that's going to be very energy efficient so you're drawing less right. from that solar and then you can share that you know, with other uh, structures and other communities, other right. homes within the community. But also it's much quieter, uh, it's actually safer, they're finding, right. and uh, people are just more comfortable right. uh, in that. Right, and also Sam, if you have a greenhouse structure, a lot of the cost of, of shipping fuel, logistics, and supplies you know, it's, um, you, it's important if you can generate your own power so then you don't have any logistics tail. And it's actually much quieter in case you're in uh, disaster zones or, or areas that are, are, are threatening. Yeah, I would agree with you. And just what we're seeing here, these gentlemen are actually assembling this. You can see uh, how thick the insulation is and how they're putting it all together. And this is a close-up of that. I mean, this is an incredible amount of insulation that you have in there, Joel, just as you're saying. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the things you and I have been talking about for years right. is that we need to have that, but also put in so you're resilient within your own structure right. as far as the energy, even your water and food. Well, Sam, there was actually a program called PEAK, the Prepositioning Expeditionary mm -hmm. Assistance Kit Program that we started. I think you even had a show about this years ago. Right. That I think now with this kind of, this could actually produce in each country, in each community. They could actually build their own and they could expand this so it would create jobs for people. Yeah, and this is where we're getting back to this, but this is uh, some of those uh, types of structures where they literally just lock in place and you can actually put up, you know, a complete floor within a matter of a few hours, wow. if not minutes, wow. you know, once you get really uh, used to doing this and you can see how this interlocks. Right. And right. Uh, very energy efficient, uh, very fast to put up. Right. And this is something, and I think, Joe, you really have that uh, special point about allowing people to manufacture these in their own site right. and within their country so you're right. not shipping air right. through the insulation <laughs> but you're shipping uh, allow the house to be in there right. and uh, but looking at this as far as this uh, whole thing about the real value as far as US military and American consumer this is something I think you can address because you and I have talked about this yes, right so anyway this this balance we talked about the National Guard Yes. wanting to be off-grid. Tell right. us a little bit about that and how that fits to right. what the um, whole housing solution wants to do. Well, well, within the National Guard, we have a program called okay. this. Okay, I think we got our Skype back. Right. Okay. Uh, Ron, you back with us? Yes, I am. Okay, we're glad to have you. We were just moving on, having a great time talking about you. <laughs> But uh, this whole thing I, I with, the U that. with the uh, U.S. military and the American consumer, why this balance? Because I know you started out with a lot of emphasis, you know, with the military, but you're really moving more and more into the public sphere. Why, why that move? Well, it, you know, it, it's actually it's an interesting thing, and I'd and I like to tie back on to uh, Joel's question, if I may, real quickly. Uh, the, the major reason that, that we found traction with him the DOD in particular, and then it turns out also within NGOs, is that ultimately when we're looking at the reduction of the logistical burden for the U.S. military when they go abroad, it's, it's truly dramatic. It turns out that NGOs have this non-governmental organizations, so think Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, um, and, and other entities, really have the same issues and challenges. And, and what we've discovered for the U.S. military, for example, is that ultimately the U.S. military but for every gallon of fuel that they use in forward operating environment, it takes seven gallons of fuel to get there. Oh, my goodness. So how That's do you terrible. reduce the burden? And, and ultimately, the one thing that does it the best is the reduction of the energy that is that, that a structure needs, in particular in this case would be uh, you know, uh, tents or containers, and that's where we really made a difference. The way it translates into the, the consumer world, and, and we're – we're, we're gingerly dipping our toe into that environment. So, so yes, we, we want to move into a more consumer-based environment, but we know that this is going to take some time and a lot of money. And, and we're literally dipping our toe into this in a slow manner. Uh, we just recently fielded a shelter for uh, to help people um, affected by Michael, in this particular case, Hurricane Michael. And so uh, the, the benefits remain the same. It's something that is 
easy to assemble. So think IKEA meets construction. Uh, very, very efficient from an energy standpoint. And I'll give you an example. We fielded a, a small shelter about 16 by 16 feet, roughly. And that shelter can either use a half a dozen solar panels to run uh, air conditioning and lights and, and TVs, et cetera, or I've actually run that unit for hours on end, uh, literally for nine hours with a gallon of fuel using a 2KW generator. So so it's IKEA meets construction, and then you live in a Yeti cup. And I think people understand the fact that that is really where everything kind of falls together into in, into understanding that the less energy you use, the easier it is to keep the, the environment comfortable for you to live in. Yeah, I'm going to uh, go back and forth. We have this uh, this heavy-duty truck on uh, two of your panels there showing that they're not even flexing whatsoever. And then you have uh, these two uh, military people moving one of these around. So it gives you an idea of the lightweight nature of this, but also the actual strength of it at the same time. And that's really using composites, which everybody has heard of, especially considering that uh, when you look at, at race cars, you look at you look at the space station, you look at some of the newer uh, commercial airplanes, they are all using a composite sandwich construction. That's what we use. Uh, our material is a little less esoteric. It's, it's a little bit more down to earth, mm -hmm. but more affordable. But the premise, the concept remains the same. And, well, know, it's interesting, uh, Ron, you have uh, some of your workmen all standing on this house that you put together. How long did it actually take to assemble this? That particular structure took less than six hours to build. Uh, actually, if you, if you were to zoom in really carefully, you'll see that one of the people on the roof is actually me. Uh, I will tell you also that that structure has been sitting in, uh, on a U.S. military base in, in the southeast part of the, of the country, and it has gone through two hurricanes and seven tropical storms. And it is built up off ground. It's using our, our concept and, and our technology, and it's actually the first building of that size that we've ever built. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, we absolutely run out of time, Ron. What do you see for the growth and expansion as far as uh, your organization and its future over the next, say, 5, 10, 15 years? We have to be quick. We have about 20 seconds. In, in, in a nutshell, we, we see A, continuing to help our, our troops. This is really where our focus on is right now. The second step is, is continuing to grow and develop our, our mobile platform for healthcare, uh, both local and international. And then last but not least, find a smart way to enter into the commercial world to, uh, to be able to develop these. This is Ron uh, Ben Z, President and CEO of World Housing Solutions. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Can we have a gun? What's up? Can we have a gun? Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. Love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh. But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Last night at high school... I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <sighs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting? Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the... Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. 
You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> To the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Thank you for being with us as we're looking around the globe for what we call the best of the best. A thousand best practices, technology, services, products, processes as well. But how we're going to be able to move forward in the 21st century to provide the, the housing, the food, the fuel, the fiber, everything that's needed for about 2 billion more people on planet Earth and possibly maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century. And so we really have to look at these solutions today and not wait until these people are all here because we want to have people that actually that are vibrant and they're very much engaged in society instead of just existing on planet Earth. And we have a gentleman that's really been working on this for a number of years outside the gentleman sitting right beside me which is uh, Joel Coulter. He is the president of Mobile Sciences Consortium. He comes on as a special guest from time to time. And, but we're uh, hosting today Ron ben -Zeev. He's the president and CEO of the World Housing Solution, and he's coming in by Skype. Joel's here in the studio with me. Thank you, Joel. And uh, Ron, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, we're glad to have you. Thank you for uh, being with us. And we're talking about best practices and how this really goes into what you're doing as far as world housing solution. Uh, but we were uh, chatting a little earlier about this, uh, working with the U.S. military, uh, developing these special types of structures, very light, strong, energy efficient, uh, easy to assemble, and now you're moving into the civilian sphere. So how do you take what you gain through the uh, the study and the resources that were invested there, and then move that into the NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and also to uh, being a real response for disaster recovery. You know, the, we've been very fortunate at, through the U.S. military, we've been able to continue to develop our technology. The challenge when you're talking about social housing and the ability to provide assistance far and, and, and out, both within our borders and outside our borders comes with the challenge of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So what we do has a lot of benefit and, and technology that is based here in the U.S., but the way to do this long term really means that we're going to have to partner up with people at the local level. So we have, an, have engaging conversation with certain individuals within different entities and, and places, um, particularly in West Africa most uh, you know, most recently, but ultimately becomes a three-legged stool. And the way we see this is, A, the technology. We have it. We have the ability to share it and license it. B, we need an engaged and, and capable uh, individual entities within the local environment. And last but not least, the local government has to buy in. They have to want to introduce and incorporate prefabricated manufactured housing because ultimately that's the only way that we're going to have the ability to solve housing crisis around the world. The whole thing about this, Ron, is that people are talking about we're going to have two billion more people on the planet. We have to provide housing for them. What they don't realize is that half the housing that already exists will probably have to be rebuilt, replaced and uh, repurpose because of uh, energy efficiency, because of the change as far as the climate and the weather is concerned. So there's mo so many things that we have to consider. But looking at this uh, globe of, the, of uh, planet Earth, uh, you're actually expanding across that globe. Tell us a little bit about some of the places where you are. And then we want to get into this uh, mobile uh, response unit that's been developed in uh, looking at disaster recovery, not only within the United States, but outside the border of the United States. So, so far we've been fortunate to be a part of solutions developed and distributed by the U.S. military primarily. Uh, so both under their direct use, so the U.S. military is using our structures in a variety of different locations, but also they've implemented our technology and, and delivered solutions to places such as Kalaf in Djibouti. And uh, in that case, it's a, a women's maternity, nursery, and health clinic that has been donated by the American people through the Hearts and Mind program with the U.S. military. 
So we've been we're a little bit everywhere. We're everywhere from South Pacific to the U.S. to the Caribbean to the African continent and European continent as well, and looking to expand. So that's yeah. the world housing piece. Yeah, and looking at the, these uh, units uh, again, going back to the light nature of it. Uh, the strength and all that, it's very important as you really do move around the globe. Uh, looking at this mobile response unit, I'm going to uh, come back to that in just a minute, but Joel, I think you have the next sure, question. Sure. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you, Sam. So, Ron, you, you, in designing these things, what, are, what, did, what did you design? What are the three main needs you envision after a disaster strikes a community? So, so let's look at both the first world and, and the developing world for a moment. So when the U.S. gets, gets hit, and again, we're seeing this right now, live on our TV screens, when the U.S. or a developed world gets hit by a disaster, our residents, our, our friends, our, our communities don't become a third world country. They actually become a fourth world country. Mm. They are, we, they, we are completely ill-equipped at dealing with those disasters. So... Mobile response units that, that we're feeling will be able to do three things. A, create water. Water is, is, is literally the elixir of life. Without water, you can't live. So our units are going to be embedded with both a filtration-capable system, off-the-grid solar, as well as the ability to create water from air, which is a newer technology and getting better and better every day. The second piece is the ability to communicate. Because the moment everything gets destroyed, how do you reach back and tell, A, your loved ones that you're okay, and B, how do you communicate back with, right. with the command and control centers? And then last but not least, obviously, is power. So the integration of solar, batteries, small generator, the ability to run the, these systems off the grid are all integral to the success. And then, and then ultimately, it's also how simple are they to be deployed. And because our units are not only super high insulated structures, but also can be towed with a simple pickup truck, it now completely transcends the traditional approach of delivering solutions in, in a disaster-stricken environment or preposition them as needed. Yeah, and I think this is something that we really need to think about, Ron, as a society and uh, really all over the globe, not just the United Nations and World Bank, IMF, many of these funding uh, international bodies but actually how do we have the resources there when people need it because take a place like Indonesia they just keep getting hit you know year after year after year and there's many other nations that have those same issues and the United States of course I mean we're uh, more and more uh, violent uh, weather events are happening all over uh, the United States but going to these uh, mobile uh, response units uh, we're looking at the the flooring of this why develop these, and how are these different than other structures? Uh, the, the intent, again, is to be able to do something that's simple. It, that's really part of our DNA, is how simple can it be to deploy, to use, to, to, uh, you know, to set up quickly by unskilled individuals. That's why we, we got away from a self-propelled vehicle, trucks in particular, or heavy containers or unsanitary tents. Mm -hmm. Now, it has its place in, in, in the arsenal. We have to have something that can be deployed. Even though it's a 3,000-year-old technology, it's still necessary. But the moment you establish a beachhead in any environment, you need to get rid of the tent and now establish and use a more reliable and, and more sustainable structure. And that's where we, we step in. Those particular units are agnostic. They can be everything from... A medical clinic, as we did for the U.S., for FEMA in, in Puerto Rico. They can be tactical operating centers. They can be mass casualty evacuation and anything and everything in between. Because yeah, we're the whole thing about it, these are... With our structures. Yeah, these are really, uh, as we could say, ecumenical. They can be used for anything. And you see the simplicity of all this. But what is a... I haven't heard this before. I know about food deserts, but a healthcare desert. What is that? And how does that relate to these mobile units? So a healthcare desert, we've, all, we've heard of health, uh, of food deserts, and, and food deserts are places where they don't have access to grocery stores like we take for granted, but there are places in the U.S. that don't have that. Same thing with the healthcare problem. A lot of people use um, emergency rooms as their, as their healthcare. So how can we deploy, deliver, equivalency of care, something that is just as good as what you would get in your current doctor, but on mobile, in a mobile way. 
so when when you need dialysis, where do you go, or or how do you set things up so that you can go and get dental checkups and dental care in communities that are that don't have access for whatever reason it may be, don't have access to a traditional environment. These platforms will provide that and provide those today in 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 those environments, and that's really the the beauty. And when and the you whole... twin the technology behind it, you can now add. Um, you know, virtual, re- not virtual reality, but actually doctors uh, coming in through, uh, you know, through remote through cameras and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, uh, coming in a, a virtual way, but still. Telemedicine, yeah. Yeah, right. and still being very real and, and engaged. And uh, these are very simple to put in. Uh, they're uh, lightweight, even though they're a, a full structure because of the actual strength that you have. Uh, but looking at these, uh, as far as they're being deployed, it looks like these could actually put be put just about anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and that was the plan originally when, when the, the company was born. It was to deal with the disaster in, in Haiti. And as those who know, it's a mountainous environment. You don't have a lot of flat places to, to build shelters. And everyone congregated and aggregated in flat places, which then created health issues. So we designed a platform that could be elevated above ground thereby not dealing and not having to deal with drainage issues, and then can be deployed very quickly, and that would give you more places to put them. We can put them, we we'll almost have two feet of, 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 of height between one end to the other of the building. Yeah, and the whole thing about this, too, these can be uh, easily uh, removed and uh, taken to another location. You're just talking about uh, Puerto Rico, uh, but it could be anywhere in a disaster area in uh, the southern part of the United States, out in California with their wildflowers that uh, go through and burn down buildings and and all that. So looking at this, as far as the long term and going in with these mobile response units, what do you see for the uh, expansion and use of these over the next 5, 10, or 15 years? And we have about 30 seconds to do all that, Ron. So everything from uh, current discussions with medical uh, teams throughout the uh, Florida hospital being one of them, which is a local hospital, but they, they are part of the you know, Adventist Healthcare. Uh, everyone is interested in how do we send people from coming into the ER, and those are ways to do that. And then ultimately introducing them and, and incorporating them as part of a preposition response system in order to be able to respond quickly to a disaster, wherever it may be. Yeah, I tell you, I just, it's absolutely fantastic, Ron, what you're doing. Uh, this is Ron Benzeev. He's the president and CEO of World Housing Solution. Came in by Skype. My uh, good friend and colleague, Joel Coulter, president of the uh, Mobile Sciences Consortium, right beside me. And it's really interesting to see how we're actually advancing the technology using very lightweight and strong materials as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. So... I just moved in with his family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born, and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, mm. the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Wow. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. No. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. 
If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. We're back to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we're looking around the globe and as we say, we're looking for solutions. Many people know what the problems are and much of the media keeps talking about the problems, but at the same time, we need to talk about the solutions or the best practices that are being evolved, developed, and experimented with, actually used in many countries around the globe. And so that's what we're talking about right now. We're gonna be talking about how in disaster areas, Outside of water, the number two thing that you really need is power. And if you look at the disasters we've had, that is one of the issues that people do not have the power available at the time that they absolutely critically need it. And so the whole thing about it is that we really need to to do that. And uh, who will be coming on uh, soon will be uh, Matthew Parham. He's electrical engineer of Solar Stick. But sitting right beside me is my special guest. This is Joel Coulter, president of the Mobile Sciences Corporation. And Joel, you know about uh, Solar Stick. Yes, You've I do. met them. Actually, we met them several Start. years ago yes. over at the National Defense University and yes. now with George Mason University. Tell us a little bit about Solar Stick. Why you've, you've been impressed? Because actually, you took me over and introduced me to these folks. Yes, I, I think they take they focus on power in many different ways to generate that power, solar and wind, and they combine. So they're a hybrid. Mm -hmm. So as you know, Sam, in some sites, you may not have sun all the time, and you may not have wind all the time. But if you combine wind and solar together, you have a much better chance of having resilient power. And they do uh, systems in various sizes. So they have very small units. So in the, co in, in the condition of rapidly deploying mm -hmm. to a disaster, they have units that are being rapidly deployed. And they have more larger units for pre-positioned you know, systems. Yeah, you know, the whole thing about this, uh, looking at this diagram here, you know, you think about the grid, you don't really think about all these things here as far as the storage, the power management, yeah. power generation, uh, the load, and what you're taking out of it. And something you have I've been talking about over the years is that even if you go to the renewables, why have a system that's going to keep dragging down what you're going to produce, whether it's coming from the sun or the wind or right. uh, water power, whatever it may be. So it's uh, very important to have these types of systems. And right. I think that's uh, one of the very interesting things about uh, Solar Stick is that they've really been working on, you know, how do we deploy this and do it very quickly. Right. But one of the questions uh, as we're waiting on getting uh, Matt on, on with us through Skype why is it important in a disaster that we almost instantly need to be there and responding to people? Well, what people don't realize is disasters can be localized. And, and, and the electric grid is like a cloud we have in technology. It can cascade. Mm -hmm. So a failure in one area of like Los Angeles, let's say we have a hurricane, that can actually, if the power starts going on a surge, it can affect the whole country. These grids are connected. People don't realize in the United States, that about 65% of all our power comes from small little rural electric co-ops that need to have backup, like a you know, solar stick, mm -hmm. in case they lose because you could have a cascading failure. Yeah, and the whole thing about this, looking at these solar panels, uh, you know, if you have solar, you know, they say sun in the day and wind at night. Right. You know, do that. Of course, there's going to be different uh, velocities, different intensity of the sun. Yes. You have cloudy days. You'll have typhoons. You'll have all these other kinds of things. Uh, but in general, you're going to have most of this, and that's where storage comes into yep. play. Yep. Now, why is storage so critical? Well, because you can't just deliver the power to the grid immediately. It has to be managed, and storage is one of the highest costs. But we know that battery storage is coming down and down and all the innovations around the world in Asia for hybrid batteries, we have lithium ion. So you have to store it. You can't just dump the power you generate 
into a grid. And so we, in our country, we have a thing called power purchase agreements. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The PPAs. But looking at this right now, you've got solar and wind uh, more and more coming together. And that's really one of the special specialties as far as solar stick is concerned. But this is something that many companies are now moving in that realizing that you don't just do solar. Right. in most cases, and you're not just doing wind, that you want to have a combination of that. And there may be even a third source that you're going to have well, as well. So yes. looking at this um, photograph here as far as the uh, the wind and the solar, this is something that's uh, very important that we, right. we look at and we develop this. How do we get to the efficiency, Joel? Well, that is a, a function of optimizers. We are starting to optimize the energy system so that we can, if it's, we have even hydro, we can combine hydro. We want to optimize the energy efficiency because obviously the cost could overrun long-term impacts of, of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Well, the whole thing about this, uh, looking at this uh, deployment here, this is the, the batteries and you can see this intense sunshine. Right. Uh, but, you know, as far as having these batteries, this is what really takes uh, some of the pressure off of uh, not having renewables because right. you have the storage, and so you keep. And when you're not using it or you're in non-peak at times, you start topping off your batteries. Right. What does topping off the battery really mean, Joel? Well, I think topping off the battery just means that you can have connectivity to other batteries and other. So there are cellular there are connections between other batteries. So you 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 don't go over that because you lose storage if you if you um, basically have you know it, I, I'm losing the well, that's okay uh, yes. anyway we'll see it here the, the topping off is that you try to keep your batteries full at all times yes. when you when you're not actually having to right. have the power being drawn off you know out of you know this distributed energy system right. or coming off the grid because right. actually you may be these uh, batteries may be connected to a huge grid that goes across you know, right. cities, it right. goes across states, right. uh, regions, what have you. And so you want to be sending it out. And so this is kind of the, the peak load, if you will. Right. You know, there's uh, the uh, peak load plants. We're using, many of them are using natural gas right. to yeah, do right. that. But right. more and more, this is happening through, you know, solar and wind. And it's just interesting to see these uh, technologies here. And we see these batteries and, and the management system. And I think this is what it's all about, Joel, is where you have the proper management system right. and uh, allow the uh, to draw as much as you can from natural. And even if you're tied into the grid, mm -hmm. that may be using nuclear, it could be natural gas, it could be coal, it could be, you know, whatever it is. Uh, the whole thing is that, you know, we could just proceed with that right. and continue to use the, the, uh, the system itself. But uh, looking at this management system, this is very sophisticated, Joel. And again, going back to the, um, uh, you know, the management system that we have. And we have Esther from San Diego that uh, really wants to know about this management system because we talked about, mm -hmm. you know, the management and, uh, you know, the systems that we're actually using and all that. So why do we have to be very uh, cautious and at the same time, very proactive as far as managing uh, whether it's wind and solar okay. or managing the grid itself. So, Sam, I think a lot of what's happening now with solar, wind, hydro is that they're connected to the Internet. So it, they create more digital data. In fact, we are thinking that electric grids, and whether they're solar or wind, can actually be their own data center. Mm -hmm. And so, and with, that's what we're seeing here, actually. Yeah, and, and so when they become a data center, you have to be concerned about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually even talking about data pods, that actually a grid, a, a small little grid would be a data pod, and yet it would have to be secured. Because mm -hmm. if you don't secure it, then that digital connections and the digital management system could be, you could shut it off, and then you lose that data. So I think we have to create our own dashboards as we do for oil now, gas. Uh, you now, we're using jargon. What's a dashboard? A dashboard. So in the oil, gas, chemical, and nuclear industry, we monitor the vibration, the flow, the temperature of those industries. Well, you have to do the same thing for a digital management system of electric grid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now whether it's coming from uh, renewables or, or exactly. fossil fuels. And we, and we can't make it complex 
because then the people in the local communities could not manage their own grids. Mm -hmm. And going back to that resiliency factors, we mm -hmm. really want to help and empower the communities at the edge to be responsible for their own power, their own water, uh, and their own food. Yeah, and I think that's what es Esther of uh, San Diego was asking about, is how do we use all these new technologies? How do we use, uh, you know, this uh, renewable energy yes. in order to augment what we're doing as we go more and more, this is going into the bridge of what the real future is going to be. And you can see that uh, the system here where it's actually uh, creating that, uh, that data trail that right. uh, you were talking about right. earlier. And this is monitoring these batteries and making sure that they're uh, staying uh, very efficient. But looking at this system here, this is actually a deployment overseas by uh, right. SolarStick because right. they, they are a global company. And now we're looking at absolutely everything here. You know, we're looking at they're generating, they're monitoring, they're distributing the uh, the electricity to be used actually on this ship that we're looking at right here. Right. Why is it so important that we don't just look at it as it's a solar panel or it's a wind turbine, but it really is a whole system? Right. Well, it's it, again the context of systems of systems, and they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And if you do not manage those interconnections you won't see where the, you want to catch the flaw early because if you don't catch it early, it could then, especially if it's a cyber attack, uh, the patterns, because one of the unique things about the digital management system, it, it, would, it would actually recognize and capture that attack, mm -hmm. which that's a learning system. And so I think, I look at the, any digital system. So what you're saying learning. is, Joel, is actually these systems within a system are actually learning, they're, they're developing in a sense, they're almost their own logic and their, right. their own understanding to right. protect themselves, just like we're looking at here. This is a forward deployed uh, entire system. It's out there by itself, right. but it's still being monitored some 10,000 miles away. Right. So all these, what's interesting about technology is we have AI now, we have machine learning and- AI, actually, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and machine learning, but actually in energy, there's a machine to machine level of energy before it touches the internet. Mm -hmm. So can we get at that machine level? Oh, of course we can. And then the important thing is how do we route that data? Mm -hmm. Where does that data go? Yeah, and, and who's, who's actually monitoring it? Right. Exactly so. Yeah. And this whole thing, too, is that we're talking about all the renewable energy, but a lot of this power is actually going what we're looking at right here. This is part of the big grid. Right. And uh, so it's not the fact they're incompatible, is that we need to make sure they're compatible as possible and actually are, are helping the, the system. And what we're looking at here is actually, uh, this is something where you actually have monitors in a disaster area where they go up and take the, uh, the photographs, where there's no water, where there's no energy, where there's you know all right. these needs that right. you have, and we need to be able to do that through these dirigibles or, right. or whatever. I think I think you'll find more and more putting energy uh, data centers out the edge because you have so much sensors and so much data coming in. It has to be managed in the edge. That's fantastic. Well, uh, we missed our uh, Matthew Prime, but he provided all the slides. This is Joel Coulter as we create the Emerald Planet. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it.
It's a big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. You know, and it's the huge. salary. Oh my god, yes. Right? I mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents, and <laughs> right before, the, yeah, so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, what did you? to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States on a week-to-week -week basis, looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And we're looking at the notion and the topic and the reality, all three of those, as far as how we're going to have the energy to handle 9 billion people on the planet by 2050, and then maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the 21st century, where are we going to get the power? That's really one of the things. And even though we know water is life, we have to have water to exist, at the same time, more and more, because uh, more people are now living in cities, that we actually have the power to move this water. And we have a gentleman, uh, Matthew uh, Matt Parham. He's an electrical engineer for Solar Stick. He's to come in by Skype. And special guest sitting right beside me is Joel Coulter, who is the president of Mobile Sciences Consortium. And uh, welcome back. Thank you, Sam. Glad to be here. Joel, it's always good to have you. And what we're looking at, this uh, the portable, resilient, and sustainable renewable energy. This is one of the things, Joel, as yes. you know, is uh, coming in on time, and Matt, I think, is here by telephone. Matt, are you here? Okay, I guess we're waiting for Matt. Anyway, looking at the uh, in, uh, renewable energy development and all that, why is it so important that we have renewable energy in the 21st century? You think we had these grids? We've practiced and worked with them for 150 years, and right. so... Well, why, I think, why, do we, why are we going to renewables? I think that as we add more technology, the draw of data centers and, and all the sensors and the robots and the internet and all that draws so much power. In fact, the data centers alone in the United States consume more power than almost any other thing we have in this country. And so I think we need to decentralize, not centralize power, and we need to find ways to generate power at the local edge. Yeah, and this is the whole thing too. As far as you have, uh, you know, more uh, bad actors in, in right. the world, sixty, almost sixty-six million people displaced now across the globe. Yes. So it's uh, the whole thing as far as uh, you know. We're just going to have to really be uh, more reliant on uh, remote and renewable energy. Right. So I think Matt is uh, here by telephone. As Matt, are you here? Yes, sir. I'm here by phone, but I'm not. Okay, ever. that's all right. You're coming in by telephone, and welcome. Glad to have you. We've been saying very good things about you, so uh, you don't have to defend yourself. But looking at the four main areas as far as renewable, this is what I have actually up on the screen since you're coming by telephone and not by Skype. We're looking at the energy storage, power management, power generation, and load. What's the intersect of all these, and why do we have to be cautious? and uh, very careful to make sure that we have all these components operating at the same time. Absolutely. So the, the energy source is pretty much the heart of a lot of these systems when it comes to power generation, power um, management, storage, and typically the load, whatever you're hammering. But the energy source is the absolute heart of the system. And that's most the efficiency come together the same whether it's a typical fuel-driven generator, whether that's a, a military generator or a traditional moon power generator, and then your solar wind generator, uh, whatever that may be, but it comes back to the heart, which is the energy storage portion, which goes to the power manager, which is actually powers your house or your equipment. 
Yeah, you know, and looking at all this, and of course now more and more people are really becoming uh, more mobile than ever uh, because of, you know, various handheld devices. And of course we have, you know, the various uh, small computers, the iPads and all these other kinds of things. So why is the, to make these really useful, uh, Matt, do we need to have renewable energy and how does that fit into the total mix as far as the uh, energy uh, consumption but also the energy supply not only in the United States but really around the globe? As far as some of the critically damaged areas or what, uh, what in particular are you talking about? Uh, everything. Everything? So. With some of the, the critical areas like uh, Puerto Rico that we've recently supported, as well as the Panhandle in Florida, um, there's you know infrastructure damage that comes with power lines and stuff like that, and people that have homes that are damaged, and just critical infrastructure that's no longer capable of supporting practical loads that include anything in your in your household. And the, the, the hybrid systems allow that kind of stuff to continue in operation even without the, the, the backbone, the, the power grid, to, to keep that going. Yeah, what we're looking at here, Matt, this is some of the technologies you have through the uh, solar stick, you know, where you're uh, bringing together wind and solar. So you have, as uh, kind of the, the phrase, catchphrase is, sun by day, wind by night. But what you're trying to do is capture all the renewable energy within that area. So when you have these disaster areas, or even when it's in a non-disaster uh, period, uh, it seems that renewable energy is needed more and more all the time because the demand is going up as we go to a planet of about 9 billion people by 2050. Absolutely. And then, and, and, you know, depending on what kind of application the system's deployed in, um, is going to depend on what kind of power generations or energy storages are needed in that, that particular area. Um, you know, in specific to things that solar stick does, some critical areas overseas need more solar or need more wind generation and need more energy storage to, to, to supply power to the critical loads, whereas back home here in the state, we need more of a uh, on-demand system where we have a larger energy storage system that absorbs a lot of that power where we typically have a very stable grid behind us. And then whenever we lose that grid power for one day, two days, three days, or God forbid a week, um, we have enough energy storage to supply that. And then we can also mitigate the energy that goes in there and mitigate the energy that we need to run our uh, loads, which would be uh, air conditioner, or refrigerator, a TV, whatever you need to have operational in your household with additional wind, solar, or generator power. That's great, a great answer too. Joel, I think you have the next question. Hi, Matt. It's, uh, so with, with your leadership position uh, in this area, what do you see as the emerging miniaturization, material science, or other technologies that you see would help uh, improve what you're doing for all kinds of climate applications? So as far as that goes, I mean, Efficiency with solar panels is something that's been climbing for the past few years. You know, solar panels used to be operating at 6 and 8% efficiency. Um, they're moving upwards towards the mid-20s to almost the 30 percentile range. And, uh, you know, as, as that technology continues to increase, it absolutely helps what we can do on our forefront to help allow whatever the applications are to, to power a household application or an application that's overseas that, that's powering a critical load, whether that's a camera or something like that. Now looking at this convergence as far as uh, disaster uh, impediments and uh, incidents, I mean, there are just it just seems like every week uh, different areas are getting hammered across the whole country, around the globe, and renewable energy. Do you see that there's actually almost an intersect now between these portable and totable systems uh, for renewables and response to disasters, uh, whether it's uh, man-made or uh, natural? Absolutely. So we, we work closely with uh, uh, Florida Emergency Management Services, and they deploy some of these man-portable systems, which is critical, a man-portable system, 
that they can deploy wherever these disasters strike. The small small areas that establish communications between uh, emergency management services and whomever they need to communicate with, as well as also allow some some level of creature comforts to kind of allow us to be humans again. Um, so the, the, the man portable systems that we deploy with a lot of the federal emergency management systems um, allow that kind of stuff to happen. Yeah, now looking at this uh, system, this was something actually developed for the United States and then it had to be deployed in, in Haiti. And so whether it's in the United States, uh, Haiti, wherever it is around the globe, it looks like we're almost having a common technology, a commonality as far as not only the nomenclature, the discussion of all this, but also the technology itself. How is that actually happening uh, through a company like uh, Power, uh, Solar Stick or other, uh, many other companies? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we've deployed a lot of these systems between Sudan to Haiti to Puerto Rico, um, a lot of these critically damaged areas. And as, as the technologies increase, it allows the systems that we deploy out there to be lighter, more efficient, and to be more functional for the actual end user that needs this equipment to operate for them for whatever their needs may be. So as the technology increases, it allows it to ship easier. It allows it to, to work more proficiently for the end user. And ultimately, it, it just allows for a more well-rounded product all around for the end user. Yeah, and I'm uh, showing this uh, converter here. Uh, this is something you're seeing more and more. And even when you're walking around the streets in Washington, D.C., uh, you see more and more houses, uh, even in uh, more economically challenged areas, are actually putting in and installing the uh, solar panels, Joel, mm -hmm. which is uh, very, very important. So looking at this technology, how easy is it to keep this going, uh, Matt? And we're just about out of time, so we have to be quick. How easy to keep this going and uh, spare parts, or do these things, you put them in, make sure they work properly, and they last for quite a while? Yeah, so absolutely. So most solar panels are good for about 25 years if utilized on a rooftop application that just purely supplements grid power. Um, when you get more deeper into these applications and you look at something that's a truly hybridized system that operates purely off of solar or wind or energy storage, there are absolutely more replacement parts and more components that need to be changed out like batteries. I mean, if, if you imagine a, a battery is like a a fuel tank, you know, you, you can only fill it up so many times before you have to change it out. And, um, you know, once once these consumables are used, they have to be replaced. But for the most part, a lot of these hybridized systems are fairly robust and they have pretty long lead times before they actually have to be replaced. Yeah, I think, Matt, uh, we're going to lose you and uh, looking at these systems is absolutely fantastic. We have this uh, modern yard with uh, both wind and uh, solar, Joel, is absolutely incredible. Matthew Parham of Solar Stick, Joel Coulter of the Mobile Sciences Consortium, as we create the ample planet.